All right, I'm here to introduce to you Dr. Adiel Teloren. And as some of you are quite familiar, he has a pretty extensive background, and so I'm going to make this very brief for you guys so you can listen more to him than to me. But he's also known in the United States as Dr. T, a little bit easier for all of us. He is a medical doctor, a doctor of chiropractic, and a licensed nutritionist. He is board certified in functional medicine, as well as oxidative medicine and chelation therapy and disability analysis. He is a professor and a dean of medical sciences at the University of Natural Medicine. And he has several projects that he's involved with, number one being an organic, 100% raw vegan restaurant in Minneapolis, and a hypoallergenic, organic, gluten-free bakery, a eco-village and healing sanctuary that he has called the Habitat for Human Animals, and several other nonprofits, one of which is the Everest Learning Academy for Nepal, or excuse me, it's in Nepal, and it's a network of schools, child care centers, and orphanages that protects, nurtures, and educates thousands of disadvantaged children throughout the rural areas of Nepal from child trafficking and slavery. So, without further ado, this is Adiel Taloran. So sometimes people don't want the truth. They just want to know that what they've been doing is good for them and forget the fact that it's hard on their liver, on their brain, and bad for their cardiovascular system and damaging their capillaries and causing them to have all kinds of skin lesions that they never, th never thought they should have and age prematurely. They don't really care about that because they want to believe that what they were told was good for them. So usually I tell people through more extensive lectures and you can get some of them for free at thetruthaboutyourfood.com. There's 12 hours of free lectures, two hours each, six different seminars. One of them is dedicated to the food that you should be eating. After all the no, 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 I wanted to focus for a change on the yes. And today, rather than go over the entire two hours of the yes, 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 I'd like you to, and I know that this food, this dessert was a yes, yes, yes kind of a dessert. You want to have at least a glimpse of what is the yes, and the rest of it you can get for free online within the truthaboutyourfood.com. And it's not what we always are told. For example, people told that, were told that if they have an apple a day, they'll keep the doctor away. Raise your hand if you actually practice that, an apple a day. What, you want to keep the doctor? Okay, raise your hand if you believe that if you ate an apple a day, you'll keep the doctor away. What's going on? Nobody believes what they're told. Okay, what if you had five apples a day? Will that keep the doctor away? Raise your hand then. Seven apples? Do you, okay, what if you, do you believe that eating an apple a day will actually make you sicker? Raise your hand if, if you believe that. One person believes that. Depends on the apple. Depends on the apple. If it's rotten. No, if it's a delicious apple, golden delicious, an apple a day. Actually, there was a study. Somebody wanted to find out if an apple a day will increase your health. Nobody thought that he would actually keep the doctor away. It's hard to keep those doctors away. <laughs> they want to do their job. And every time they go on a strike because they want an increase in salary, there's a lot less sickness and death in the population. And as a result, and this has been proven, it's been studied, and as a result, the doctors go right back to work before everybody would find out. They're willing to forego their demand for a raise when that happens. So they did a study to see what would happen if they give a group of people an apple a day in addition to their normal diet, and another group was just getting its regular diet without that apple a day. And at the end, they found out that the group that was getting the apple a day was actually having worse cardiovascular markers in their blood 
higher triglycerides, higher LDL, higher blood sugar. Now, apple is a great thing. I'm not against it. But it just so shows that we have to be a little more discerning and not just accept any adage at face value. And the reason being, go to nature. Nature tells you what to eat. Have you ever eaten crab apples, those tiny, tiny apples that grow in the wild? They're so sour and tart. They have slight sweetness in there, and that's all. But they're very edible. You just have to take your time with them. You have to eat five or six or seven very, very slowly, and then you have enough. Those are the real apples. The apples we eat today are so hybridized, so rich with additional sugars, that it's a little different from what it was supposed to be. And especially today's apples that are sweet have a lot of free fructose. Free fructose is hard on the liver. That's what we get with agave and with, num with uh, maple syrup and so forth. Yakon syrup, coconut nectars, all of those syrups are very high in free fructose. That's where they're hard on our liver, hard on our blood vessels. So if we want to focus on what to eat, let's go to nature and see what is going to be acceptable to nature and therefore to our physiology. And if we are to eat apples, we should really focus on the sour apples, the green and sour and slightly tart apples. At least they resemble the original flavors of what foods in nature were like. And that is what we should train ourselves to like again, the bitter flavor, the sour flavor, really sour, thing that we have forgotten about with today's diet, which is always looking for more and more sweet, salty, and fatty. So we need to enjoy some of those things in nature. That's why I recommend for everyone to focus on foraging once, at least in your lifetime. You have to go to nature and forage for food. Forage for food. Find out what leaves you can eat, what flowers you can eat. You'd be amazed by the huge variety of delicious flowers that could be picked in the wild everywhere you go. They're nourishing, they're rich, they're satisfying, they're colorful and attractive, and they even contain nutrients that you wouldn't expect in the form of tiny microscopic aphids that are hiding inside them. <laughs> You're not trying to kill them intentionally, of course not, but, but you know, every day you eat a broccoli, you kill tiny insects. Every time you drive to work, you kill thousands of mosquitoes and who knows what other animals. So let's be honest about it. We kill insects all the time, even if we are vegan. And we don't feel too guilty about it. Raise your hand if you're a vegan who would never kill a mosquito that is ready to poke at your skin. <laughs> Raise your hand if you haven't seen a chimpanzee or a gorilla eating termites. Everybody knows that termites are highly edible, even though I personally don't eat them. I personally don't necessarily recommend to eat them. But nature, nature has its own story. And we want to focus on the healthiest food that nature can give us, without necessarily going to what we consider extremes. I don't think anybody here would consider it extreme to eat a flower, an edible flower from nature, from the wild. Raise your hand if you have ever eaten vetch. Vetch. It's a purple leguminous flower that grows in the wild. It's like a vine. And it gives you food all summer long, in, even in the upper Midwest. You can eat it like candy. It's so delicious and it's satisfying. And when it comes to seed, you can eat the little tiny seeds from the pod. That represents the legume family. Have you ever been told that people should not be eating legumes? Many of you have heard that, haven't you? So if people tell you not to eat legume, rather than believing at face value what they decided is 
the framework of a diet that everybody should have, and many people who force you to eat a lot of flesh every day are the ones who would tell you to avoid legumes. But if they only went to nature, they would find legumes that are edible, like veg, and like wild uh, mustard. Wild, wild mustard seeds grow in those pods and you can eat them straight from the plant, raw. It's very easy and they're a great source of calories if you feel like you need more calories. So nature tells us that legumes are not off limit. They would be available in nature, in the wild, and they're easy to eat from the plant phase of the flowering all the way to the seed. And of course you can eat the green leaves the entire season. They also tell you to avoid grains. Have you heard of the no grain diet, which I call the no brain diet sometime? Yes, it's true that some grains are problematic and that a lot of vegetarians and vegans, if you heard my previous lecture today, suffer as a result of exposing themselves to grains that contain hybridized and altered proteins which cause a problem for those who are exposed to them excessively, especially in today's environment and society. But does that mean that we have to give you one single rule to avoid grains altogether? Well, don't look for me to answer, look to nature. Go to nature and forage, and you'll find out that there are plenty of grains which are basically grasses, the wild grasses, all the way from amaranth to various small seeds, smaller than amaranth, that are possible to eat in the wild in the right season. Yes, you would not have grains all year long, or all, this, all season long, but you can eat grains in nature very easily, straight from the plant. Sometimes they're dry, so you have to spend time chewing, but they're not the same grain that you get in the store, which have been dried and hardened, so you have to cook them. In nature you get grains that you could so, uh, swallow after thorough chewing, without even cooking them. I'm not saying that cooking is bad, you can cook some grains in water, but they are not totally foreign to us, since in nature we would be eating them, and those who come with me foraging every, every few weeks in the summer will know for themselves that grains are available in nature, in the wild, are edible, and there is no reason to believe for a second that our ancestors would have avoided them, because they're an easy source of calories, and we all gravitate each and every one of us wants to have more calories in one sitting. It's a built-in mechanism in our brain for survival, to want more calories when we can have them. So there's no doubt in my mind that those seeds that provide those calories would have been eaten by our ancestors as well as by ourselves if we were thrown into nature and had to forage for ourselves. Are grains and legumes the number one food in our plate? No, they are not. But I started with them just to show you that many rules that you are looking for should not be rules. Why are they not number one on our plate? Because they have a lot of calories per nutrient. So they are not nutrient dense. At the same time, they offer us some nutrients that we would not get from fruits and vegetables some nutrients that are starchy and calorically good, and even some fatty acids that we might need today more than we did in the past. That's why we have to distinguish between nutrient density and nutrient necessity. There are necessary nutrients that are nutritionally not dense. So they're not as good for us as we expect them to be. They don't have as many nutrients per calorie, but they contain something else that we still need. Maybe some fats. Maybe some fat-soluble nutrients. We need those too, even if they are not calorically um, healthy or even if they are not nutritionally dense. Are you with me? Yes. So nutritional necessity is a concept that most people don't speak about. 
but it allows you to eat sometimes foods that are not nutritionally dense. So not everything has to be kale. Not everything has to be um, collard and other greens. Sometimes you need to get more, more calories that come from, let's say, omega-3 fatty acids and some omega-6 and some omega-9. The body has good use for those fatty acids. However, they are extremely poor in terms of nutrient density. But that's okay. So our diet needs to be varied with all the nutrient-dense foods, as well as the nutritionally necessary foods. And then we would not have a feeling of excessive uh, hunger or deprivation, which many people feel when they shy away from eating fats. And you have heard many times in the vegetarian vegan movement, people avoiding all fats and all oils and all salt and feeling deprived. I see those people coming to me as patients and they say, we really try to do this, but after a few weeks, we, fa we fall off the wagon. And then they start binging in the middle of the night, trying to believe that this is just in the middle of the night, it doesn't count. <laughs> it's just sleepwalking or sleep eating. <laughs> but it is really happening to your body. And it's not your fault when it does, because if you are going to crave something so significantly that you're going to binge on it despite what you believe, why would you do that just to feel guilty afterwards? You do it because your body is craving something for a reason. This is craving fats, or craving calories, or craving some of the nutrients dissolved in them. It's not the same as being addicted to alcohol or to chocolate. It's completely different. These are real foods and real nutrients, and you're feeling that you cannot eat them. So I'm here to tell you that you can eat them. They're not necessarily the top foods. But if you don't eat them, you might start binging on things that are really harmful to you. If you don't eat salt regularly, you're going to start craving salt because your adrenals will be too weak and your electrolytes in the blood will become too low and you will start feeling the deficiency of salt in your function, in your nervous function, in your muscular function, in your contractions, you would feel that weakness and too many people shy away from salt and they think that it's a matter of opinion. So again, go to nature. What does nature say? Look at other animals in nature and what do they eat if they are similar to us? Have you seen what elephants do? Elephants put their entire body's weight on one foot to get salt. And they drink the water that is extremely salty, that percolates from the earth as a result of their, the, the hole that they dig in because they love that salt. We have a lot in common with elephants, by the way. We have bare skin, like they do. We have no fur, like they don't. We have subcutaneous fat, like they do. We have a lot in common with elephants and other water mammals. Water mammals that have no fur are very similar to human in some very specific traits. And all of those animals that lived close to the sea had a history of numerous years of eating foods from the sea that were naturally salty. Go to the Pacific Ocean beach and see what's washing onto the beach in large quantities. Sea vegetables. And you can pick them, and if you know that it's clean area, which we know it's not, if you try to ignore the sewer that's coming into the water nearby, and you taste it, you'll see that it is crunchy and salty and fun to eat. It's tasty and it's filling and satisfying. And it has numerous nutrients that we used to eat for millennia because we lived next to the, to the sea. If you go today to the areas similar to where we came from, 
where humans all arrived from, you see that you can barely make it through the jungle, it's so thick. The only area you can easily thrive and walk and move is right next to the water. So humans have expanded their habitat continuously on the beaches of Africa and Southern Asia all the way to Australia. And very recently, they started going into the Americas and into Europe. Very recently. Until then, they ate almost exclusively, or at least 50% of their diet was based on what they got from the sea, which was a lot of seaweeds and sea vegetables, which were salty. And that's why we developed mechanisms to regulate our salt intake. We have our salty sweat, our salty tears. That tells us something. If somebody tells me not to eat salt, I have to ask them why not, because in nature we would. And they would have to prove to me why not. I'm not going to take their opinion on face value. And I would look at the scientific research and it will show you that salt is actually good for you as long as it's wholesome. As long as it's not white table salt. All the bad studies about salt were done with table salt, sodium chloride. It's irrelevant to people who eat wholesome salt. So do use some salt, but make sure it's healthy. And it will make your vegetables taste better. Because in nature, most of your vegetables will come from the sea with their own salt already inside them. Today we eat a lot more vegetables from the ground, from the land, not from the sea. That's great. They're wonderful. They have all those nutrients, phytonutrients, all those minerals, but they don't have enough salt, and they're lacking in some other trace elements, and they need to be complemented by sea vegetables because of the different types of mucopolysaccharides, different components of the structure of sea vegetables, which makes them stand apart from the regular land vegetables we are accustomed to. They have numerous functions in digestion, in hormones, in metabolism. They help us regulate and keep our blood sugar even. And today we have problems because we are lacking those mucopolysaccharides. So I recommend that every day, or at least three or four times a week, get a good dose of sea vegetables or the equivalent of sea vegetables. Sometimes they come in highly concentrated liquids. Sometimes you can get them dehydrated. Try and get them from pure sources, from clean sources. Mostly from maybe the northern Atlantic is going to be a little safer. So that is something everybody should be focusing on adding to their food. Now, to be healthy, you need to avoid superfoods. Yes, you need to focus on real food. Superfood is a marketing tactic. Every food that is wholesome and real and nutrient rich or nutrient it has nutrient necessitating components within it is to me super without being called a superfood. It's just something that you need. Until five years ago or ten years ago, people never heard of the term superfood. And they never looked for those exotic products that usually contain stimulants and other physiologically altering devices making us somehow hooked. And if we look for foods to become our medicine, meaning we select a specific food for a specific symptom, for example, lack of libido, what are we doing to ourselves? We are forgetting what libido should be about how it should come by itself to be there. And we start depending on something external instead of addressing the real reason why we lost our libido in the first place. And we start setting the bar higher and higher to the point where we cannot be ever satisfied with nature, with what's real. So we need to start shifting our awareness into thinking of what's real.
and from now on eat real foods, not something that somebody has a medical promise attached to it. Real foods, even if they come as a concentrate, they're still the real food, whether it's sea weeds or sea vegetables, or whether it is condiments like spices. Spices are wonderful. Just like salt, wholesome salt is, you need to focus on spices. Why is that? Because spices have not been hybridized. All the small spices that we add to our food for taste, flavor, like turmeric and, and ginger and mint leaves and cilantro, parsley, etc., all of those have not been hybridized. They are still the real food that they used to be and therefore they are most nutritionally rich. So we need to use them freely in our salads. Make the salads more interesting as well. Make it jump with joy, with the flavors. Instead of just relying every day on lettuce and spinach. Lettuce and spinach are fine, but you want to have more of those foods. Every time you eat, make sure that you have dill in there. And focus on less hybridized vegetables like arugula. And look for things that you don't normally find in the supermarket, like purslane for your omega-3, naturally occurring omega-3 in a live plant. Purslane is so easy to plant in your own kitchen. And then you can start eating your own little branches of purslane almost every meal if you want, or at least three times a week. They're simple foods, so they don't have to worry about the complexity of proteins. They contain some fat, but fat is not leading to an immune reaction, like proteins do. If you focus on these and on the general dark green leafies, all the dark green leafy vegetables, and make sure that you have cruciferous vegetables every day, crucifers are crucial. Think about it like that. Crucifer, crucial. It's not a superfood, but it should be called that if anything should. Today in our polluted environment, crucifers provide us with many detoxif detoxicants, many nutrients that help us detoxify. They provide us with sulfur, which contribute to detoxification process. They have natural antioxidants and they support our liver process of eliminating toxins from our body. So every day you need to have cruciferous vegetables. These are real foods. What about fruit? How many of you heard that fruits are evil? Some of you have. Again, go to nature. Don't ask for anybody's opinion. Don't start quoting different gurus who say this is good or this is bad. Go to the ultimate teacher, which is Mother Nature. In Mother Nature, what are the fruits that are so easily available in the wild? Berries. Raspberries, cherries, elderberries. We eat them all the time in the wild. Absolutely no reason to avoid fruit like that. We can also find other fruits that are not too different from what they were and don't have a high level of free fructose, like plums and peaches. If you eat the fruits that contain a lot of free fructose, the highly hybridized ones, namely pears and apples, eat them in smaller quantities or cut them and sp sprinkle them over a vegetable salad or something else like a fruit salad or in a green smoothie to dilute them. So you don't get a huge amount of free fructose all at once as a result of hybridization. So this way you can enjoy some of the apples and pears as well. In nature you can find grapes too. They're a little more sour and a little smaller, but they contain big seeds. But they are not that far from the grapes we eat today. So grapes are not evil. They're close to nature. The problem is that some of us have harmed their bodies so much over the years with all those concentrated sweeteners all those syrups, 
that contain a huge amount of free fructose, like maple and agave and so forth. Some of us have done so much of that because we were told it's good for us, only because it had low glycemic index. But believe me, I prefer high glycemic index than high free fructose. Both are bad. Free fructose is so harsh on the liver, it causes fatty liver. And many people, as a result of eating those things for many years, or going into extreme diets like fasting for a long time, fasting for the body is starvation. Again, don't look for my opinion, go to nature. In nature, no mammal selects intentionally or intentionally elects to fast. Not for that long of an amount of time. And when you do go fast like that, you cause fatty liver. That's one of the well-known results of long-term fasting. So yes, you can feel better by avoiding all kind of junk foods and inflammatory foods. But what is the long-term ramification beyond the immediate improvement that you would feel? These are the reasons why so many people who are health conscious develop fatty liver. And those people have a hard time with fructose, and those people would feel bad when they eat fruit in excessive amounts all at once. It does not make fruits evil. It makes your liver a victim of your own lifestyle choices. And therefore, you have to first fix your liver, defat it, or go easy on the fruit temporarily if that's your condition individually, so you can distribute the fruits slowly throughout the day in small amounts. And then your liver will be able to handle them and convert them to glucose appropriately instead of having a flood of fructose into your circulation, which is what you do not want. So you see, it's an individual thing. For some of us, fruits will be difficult, but for others, they can have fruits in an unlimited way. So if somebody starts eating huge amount of fruits every day, tells you, hey, everybody should be like me. Everybody should eat 30 bananas a day and feel good. Just because a few people succeeded in sticking around with this type of a diet and are carrying the flag of their success, are you going to hear the story of thousands who failed on it? Who already moved to another thing, another fad, another search? You're not going to hear their story. And the majority of people could have failed, but you would never hear about them. You would only hear from the few who are still yelling on the website what a great diet they have, and by the way, making a living at it too. So you don't know the truth when you just look at the internet. And you have to be concerned about what is really happening. And people are trying it, and some of them can't handle all that fruit. Others, who have not damaged themselves beforehand, can handle 30 bananas a day. I'm not saying that it's necessarily the best thing for them. At least they have some good source of calories that are clean. There are some good things about it. Fruits are obviously better than junk food. But then you're missing on some of the important fats, which are crucial for your brain function, for your sexual function, for your stress hormones function. Today we live in a stressful environment. We need to be ready for it with stress hormones. Today we live in a toxic environment. We need to be ready for it with fat-soluble antioxidants and fat-soluble detoxicants. Therefore, to just give everybody one rule to avoid all oils and fats sometimes carries the hazard of people falling off the wagon and going to start eating meat and flesh because that's where they will get their satisfaction when they binge. I'd rather keep people steady, steady state, and feeling like they're not going through extremes. So eating your fruit, even if it were hard on you, a little bit at a time, is better than having a whole piece of bread with peanut butter and jelly. 
And some people are told to avoid fruit, so that's what they will do. They will eat peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Instead, I'd rather they ate wholesome fruit, even if it's that golden delicious apple. It will be still better for them. So start thinking about your individual needs, your individual traits, your individual history, and see if you can handle more fruit or less and go by that instead of simply following a man-made rule. Man-made rules are not, are not individually truthful. They are just a blanket statement, and it cannot be true. So you have your fruit, and you decide if it's a lot or a little, and what types. You have your greens, you have your flowers, you have your crucifers, you have the leaves. Now let's look at what's growing underneath the ground, the roots and the bulbs. Those you should eat, if nothing else, because they give you an easy source of calories. And I'd rather you had a good fill of healthy calories, even if they're not nutritionally dense, than start binging on other foods. So it's okay if you have kohlrabi and parsnips and rutabaga and radish, etc. Again, if you go to that lecture, you'll see a whole list of other foods. I don't need to give you the list. You just have an understanding. You can sometimes have sweet potatoes or yams. All of those items that are below the stem of the plant are nourishing. They are very starchy. And some people will say, oh, starch is bad for you. And some will say it's good for you. Again, look for nature. In nature, would starch be easily available? All it takes is pulling a root out of the earth and it's available. And until today, we see people going in the wilds of the tropical Central America and other places and pulling out cassava roots, and, as in tapioca, and other roots and bulbs from the earth, which become a very easy source of calories, which we need for survival and for energy. And they have other nutrients too. And those are starches that are used by our own bacteria for their own health. So is it a problem for some people? Those of us who have abnormal metabolism and cannot handle foods that are very starchy should be aware of that problem that they have developed and perhaps correct it. If they don't have the appropriate pancreatic function, pancreatic enzymes, to break down those starches, if they don't make enough amylase to break those starches, they might need to go easy on the starches, temporarily at least, because of their new situations. But in general, it is definitely a food that we should consider daily in our diet just so that we are satisfied because there's one thing I don't want any of you to be, starving. I don't want vegans and vegetarians to go around feeling deprived all day long and drooling when they see their friends eating stuff that they used to eat. As long as your stomach is full with stuff that is giving you nourishment and calories more than the typical average food that most people eat, it's already a step in the right direction. It's not a top food, but it can become a top food, if nothing else, because it prevents you from eating an under food, a bottom food. Those are below the earth. Above the earth, we already have the seeds, which we talked about earlier, the grains and the legumes, which could become a problem if you eat the same type every day. That's why I recommend to rotate them. And definitely to avoid the one that you are sensitive to. If you are sensitive to soy, and a lot of people are, then you have to avoid soy, I'm sorry. And focus on other legumes. Have your lentils, have your peas, have your green beans. And if you are sensitive to corn, that's not anybody's fault but the industry that fed you corn every day. 
listen to my lecture when it will be on YouTube that I did uh, a few hours ago here about these foods that are highly proteinaceous and that are becoming antigenic. Our body manufactures antibodies against them if we are exposed to them every day. So start being wise about the types of legumes and grains that you eat so that you can become healthy vegetarians, healthy vegans. And even omnivores would become a lot healthier when they abide by those rules and they'll be able to go more towards plant-based diet if they do that. However, if they go plant-based and eat lots of legumes like soy and peanuts, which are highly allergenic and sensitizer, and eat wheat gluten all the time because it's convenient and cheap, then they become unhealthy vegetarians, unhealthy vegans, and they give our all, us all a bad name. And many of them end up going on to paleo diets or eating a lot of flesh because they didn't do well. And all they had to do was stop eating their gluten and they would have been fine. They would have been healthy on plant-based diet. But I know a lot of those people. They become my patients. And unfortunately, they are still doing horrible things to their body as long as they feel better right now because of the avoidance of gluten or soy that they were sensitive to. So the gluten is not good for most people. Maybe 40 or 50 percent of the population can handle it, but in a small amount and not so frequently. Then you are starting to eat smarter foods and your body will thank you. And none of that was superfoods, have you noticed? However, we do need to look um, at something that we normally don't do when we consider food, yet they are a part of our diet in nature. In nature, you inhale molecules, even if you don't eat them, and whenever you inhale them, they enter directly into your bloodstream. Those are the bioactive plant fraction molecules that every plant diffuses into the air to protect itself. And we used to be inhaling them every second of our lives. Now we have the opportunity to do it again by bringing nature into our own homes. That's a part of plant-based life that most of us have forgotten about. In nature, you would be eating dust and dirt and earth that is still on our vegetables and fruit before we pick them. We don't clean everything obsessively in nature. We just pick and eat. And we get all kinds of nutrients from the microbes that are on those plants, that are within that dust. However, if you don't grow your own food, would you trust the person who picked it for you not to have gone to the bathroom or the toilet and forgotten to wash their hands before coming and picking up your own vegetables? Therefore, people tend today to wash their fruits and vegetables. And I recommend that if you didn't grow it yourself and pick it up yourself. As a result, we are deficient in certain parts of the plant and the bacteria that come with it. And we may have some deficiencies as well because of that. So we might need to consider things like B12 as a potential thing to supplement because we also damage our digestive system which used to be healthy enough to manufacture a lot, of, a lot of B12. Now it can't, because many of us are, have already damaged our microflora beyond repair. It's not so easy. So let's focus on what you do to improve your health. Every day, you have your big vegetable salads with all the colors, you add to it all the spices that we talked about earlier. Every day, you spread fruit throughout the day, unless you have a very strong constitution and you have not damaged your, your liver and you can hold, handle any amount of fruit at any time, which is fine. If you can handle it, go for it. But if you can't, go easy and go throughout the whole day slowly and dilute your fruits with vegetables or greens in those situations. Every day, you have at least a big dose of cruciferous vegetables. So a whole 
head of cauliflower. It can be steamed or raw. A whole head of broccoli or, or Brussels sprouts or the greens of the, of the kohlrabi or the greens of the radish. These are all crucifers. Definitely eat the greens of the broccoli and the greens around the cabbage and the cauliflower instead of just eating the flower. Sometimes the greens are more nourishing than the flower itself and people throw them away. So eat those as well. Eat the tops of the beets, not just the beets. Every day, consider steaming some, ve- some greens that are beyond what's in the solid. And every day, have a little bit at least of some of the roots and bulbs to get more calories and get satisfied, only because today we have been spoiled by short, brief, and intense meals instead of foraging throughout the whole day. So we have no choice but to get more calories in a short amount of time. That's why the starches are often beneficial, especially the ones that are are simple, that are not high in protein. The ones that are not simple are the grains and the legumes. Those you can have four or five times a week of each type, but make sure you rotate them. Try not to repeat them more than once a week, each type. And realize that when you have a huge quantity of them, if you have digestive issues, it might be a problem. And if you're sensitive to some of them, you may have to avoid those and opt for others. So be cautious with those. You don't have to have them in large amounts for healthy life. You can have them in small amounts, but if you really need them for more calories, um, then focus more on the starches that come from the roots and bulbs because they're simpler for yourself. And try to, to dilute them with vegetables in general. The vegetables will make them less proteinaceous. Those are the, the more risky ones because they're so complex and hard to digest, especially for people who have undermined their digestive health. Nuts and seeds like walnuts, pecans, hazelnuts, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, Brazil nuts, pine nuts, etc. Those types of fatty seeds are necessary for our health. So they are nutrient necessity type foods, even if they are nutritionally not dense at all because of all that fat. They are complex for digestion because of the combination of proteins and fat yet they are necessary. And in nature we would have had easy access to them everywhere and anywhere throughout the year because different plants come to seed at different times. And remember, we all came from the tropics where there was no real seasonality. So we had access to those seeds, those fatty seeds, just like we had access to very fatty fruit from durian to coconut to jackfruits, to avocados, we already had access to very fatty food. That's why we have a gallbladder, to handle a large amount of fat all at once. The gallbladder can squeeze a large amount of bile all at once. So don't listen to those fears of eating fat when our physiology is made for that, unless you have a fatty liver, in which case you have to Again, dilute your fatty food and spread them out thin throughout the day. Those nuts and seeds have to therefore be sprinkled on your vegetables or sprinkled over your fruit rather than eat them in huge amounts at once like trail mix. So if that's your way to binge, having a bag of trail mix, nuts and seeds, you are doing yourself damage. That's too much. You should always eat your nuts and seed as a part of the meal and diluted by the simpler foods, namely the vegetables and or the fruit. Then you're not getting a huge quantity and you dilute them with all that fiber. I usually say to people, between two tablespoons and up to four tablespoons per day, heaping, depending on your body size. If you're very big, you go up to four tablespoons. If you're small, two tablespoons will be enough. Two heaping tablespoons of 
nuts and seeds that have, been, that have not been processed, that are raw, and that are not rancid. And it's not easy to find nuts and seeds today that are not rancid. Listen to my two-hour lecture on fats. The truth about fats, it's free online. And it will tell you what rancid fats are. And I'm ashamed to say, and I'm sorry to say, that many vegetarians and vegans are harming their health with rancid fats and oils. The fats and oils are good for you, but not when they're rancid. And people are dehydrating their fats, exposing them to air, light, and oxygen, pulverizing them first so that the iron and copper content can create a significant oxidative reaction leading to rusting. And you eat those rancid fats all the time without realization because they taste good. Once you roast them or dehydrate them, you will not know that they are rancid and they will age you prematurely. They will age your brain, which is made of fat, and cell membranes, which are fatty. They will damage your fat metabolism in the liver. They will affect your thyroid and other hormones. You do not want to eat rancid fat. Every time a raw nut has been pulverized and then exposed for a while to air, oxygen, or heat, that's it. It's rancid. Even inside your own body, if you eat a lot of it and you don't have enough antioxidants to, co to deal with it, it will go rancid in your body. That's why you don't want to overdo those nuts and seeds. Two, up to four tablespoons per day diluted in your vegetables or fruit. If you do everything we said so far, you have enough food. If you look at the two-hour lecture on this topic, you will see that you can never go hungry as long as you make sure that you positively put those plant-based foods on your plate. After you do all of those foods, every day, and don't forget the seaweeds, sea vegetables, if you do all that, you're going to be so full, you will not have room for anything else. And your body will avoid the detriment of junk food. You will not need, then, to be continuously supplementing with superfoods that are usually exotic things that have never been considered food until recently, that are shipped from far, far away and are changing your physiology almost like drugs do, to the point where you feel that you are required to have more and more to reach the same level of stimulation or excitement or feel good, and you become hooked. Eat real food and your stability will be assured. Your blood sugar will be stable, your hormones will be stable, your nervous system will act in a stable, relaxed manner. You won't have ups and downs of anxiety and depression, of mood disorders. You just will be like other animals are in nature, who don't seem to have our society's psychiatric problems, who don't put their baby animals on Ritalin, who don't have obese children and diabetic children, and who don't have a whole industry of superfoods to save them. And who don't even have experts who tell them what to eat. They could be so dumb and they know what to eat. And we are so smart and we need even smarter experts who tell us what to eat. <laughs> you don't need experts. Just look at nature and what nature says. And if there are changes in what nature is doing today because of our own meddling, then you might need to compensate some time with what you do and how you, in, you, know, you take things that are slightly more prepared for you, extracted or slight, sometimes supplementation may be required. Nothing wrong with that if it's compensating for something that used to be in nature. Stay stable and stay healthy and you won't need me or other nutritional clinicians 
you'll just know what a real food is intuitively because it looks like a real food or it comes from a real food or it represents a real food. And then you could be happy and successful as vegetarians and vegans, which is what will be making also our earth happier and healthier at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think the good doctor will stay a few minutes and answer questions uh, while we clean up. Can you do that for us? I, I wanted to clean up. <laughs> Fine, okay, I'll do that. I'll answer the question. I thought it you'd answer the question. Just, okay. I'll answer the question. Okay. Go ahead. Loud. The sent, the, she asked if people on a low salt or a no salt diet are doing better when they have hypertension. They're doing better not because of the low salt diet. They're doing better because they changed their diet completely. They eliminated so many foods that were causing them harm and their hypertension, like many other conditions, started abating and they feel better. But if they did exactly the same thing and still ate salt, wholesome salt, they would probably do even better. It's just that they haven't separated those variables. They put them on a healthy diet, a plant-based diet that is different from the junk they used to eat, and they feel better. And they would still feel better yet if they also had the natural salt that they need physiologically for the health of so many systems of their body. Nature knows best. You can always feel better when you eliminate what most people eliminate. When they go to doctors like Dr. Ornish, I have a lot of respect for him. He did a great job with cardiovascular disease, but he did not necessarily look or rule out some variables for the next 10 or 20 years where people want to be healthy in many other ways, not just to avoid cardiovascular disease. So there's always an extra step that nature teaches us. Nature knows better than all of us. And can, we cannot replace nature by simply giving rules to everyone. I, I think now I'll have to... We do have to get out of the auditorium and uh, clean up. So can, it, can you answer them privately, perhaps in the back while we clean up? With a microphone? Without the microphone. Can you Without the microphone. Just in the, in on an corner? individual basis. Can we okay. thank Doctor for okay. coming tonight? Yes. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.